Lieutenant Governor Carroll, Secretary Detzner, distinguished members of the Viva Florida Board, and of the St. Augustine 450th Com uh, Commemoration Commission, and ladies and gentlemen. It is a happy coincidence of history that within the next three years, Floridians will have the opportunity to celebrate two major historical moments. The first occurring in 2013 will be the 500th anniversary, or quincentenary, of the discovery of Florida by Juan Ponce de Leon. The second to take place in 2015 will be the 450th birthday of St. Augustine oldest permanent European community in what are now the United States and Canada. I have been invited to say a brief word about each of the historical events that undergird those forthcoming festivities. There are four things that most people think they know about Juan Ponce de Leon. The first is that he was the first European explorer to discover Florida. <clears throat> The second is that he was hunting a fountain of youth. The third is that he gave Florida its name. And the fourth is that we have no idea where he landed on our peninsula. To the first point, I would suggest that we say that Juan Ponce's voyage constituted the first known or documented discovery of Florida. That is because Florida's shorelines may have been sighted, even visited, beforehand by the crews of Spanish slaving ships. In the decade prior to Juan Ponce's voyage, ships out of Hispaniola, today's Dominican Republic and Haiti, sailed in ever-widening circles throughout the Caribbean and Bahamian waters in search of native islanders whom they might enslave to work the Spanish farms and mines in Hispaniola. Perhaps one or more of those expeditions happened upon this peninsula, which may account for the hostility the Florida natives showed toward Juan Ponce's crews when they landed, and account as well for Juan Ponce's finding on the lower Gulf Coast of, quote, an Indian who understood the Spanish language. In connection with my mention of an Indian, that erroneous geographic term that had its origin with Columbus, we should not neglect mention of the people who were already here when Juan Ponce arrived. Originally, Eurasians who had crossed the Siberia-Alaska ice bridge some 12,000 years ago, their descendants had spread southward through what came to be called the Americas. Here in Florida, at the time of Juan Ponce's dropping anchor, the indigenous population numbered about 350,000 persons. Not only were they and their ancestors the first discoverers of Florida, they were also this state's first land developers, home builders, farmers, and artisans. The second commonly known thing about Juan Ponce is that he stumbled upon Florida while searching for a mythical fountain of youth. We can allow that he possibly had a vague interest in that fantasy, which was widespread in the Mediterranean world. Only 39 years old, however, it is unlikely that he sensed a personal need for those waters that, quote, made old men young again. Though, as an entrepreneur, he might have considered bottling the water, if he ever found it, and selling it on late night TV. <laughs> Where the fountain is concerned, the most telling evidence lies in the asiento, or charter, that Juan Ponce received from Spanish King Fernando II, authorizing his expedition. The asiento was meticulously detailed in its specifications of what Juan Ponce was to search for. Nowhere 
in its pages was there any mention of a fountain of youth. The third thing that most people know about Juan Ponce is that he gave Florida its name. And here, common knowledge is correct. Landing on the Atlantic coast on April 2nd of 1513, our discoverer was impressed by the verdant beauty of the landscape he beheld. He decided to christen this land, which he thought was an island, La Florida, the flowery land. He stated later that he chose that name, first because the island, with what he called many refreshing trees, was beautiful to behold, and secondly, because it was Easter week, and in Spain, Easter was popularly known as Pascua Florida, Flowery Easter. As for the fourth thing we think we know about Juan Ponce, is um, that there is no way of knowing where exactly the explorer landed when he reached Florida. It may be conceded that we do not know the landing site exactly, but we are not without resources. In 1974, our country's most distinguished maritime historian, Samuel Elliott Morrison, having studied Juan Ponce's voyage out of Puerto Rico, expressed his opinion that Juan Ponce could not have landed as far north as St. Augustine because at his speed during the number of days at sea, he could not have proceeded this far north. We would never have confidence in the route and landing site, Morrison said, until a skilled mariner in a ship of the same draft and sail spread resailed the route in the same time of year. This was done in 1990 by Lieutenant Colonel Douglas T. Peck, a lifetime ocean yachtsman in a deep draft sailing cutter that responded to ocean currents as with the hull of a 16th century Spanish caravel. <coughs> he followed exactly the northwestern course recorded in the log of Juan Ponce's pilot, Anton de Alaminos, correcting for magnetic variation and for the 5.6 degree error in the Spanish compass. Peck's most striking discovery en route was that south of Grand Bahama and the Abacos, strong currents and winds pushed his vessel west-northwest through the New Providence Channel and into the north-flowing Florida Current, or as we popularly say, Gulf Stream. Peck shouldered his way northwest across the stream until he sighted the Florida shoreline, where, like Juan Ponce, he anchored in 44 feet of water. Where was he? Melbourne Beach. That resailing represents the latest and best evidentiary statement we have on the Juan Ponce landing. There is no guarantee, of course, that Melbourne Beach or another nearby beach was the landing site, but it is instructive that Dr. Eugene Lyon, Florida's leading maritime historian, told me last month that he supports Colonel Peck's findings. All I shall conclude myself is that since Peck's research voyage of 22 years ago, we do know something about this question. As for St. Augustine, founded 52 years later, we do not know exactly where Captain General Pedro Menendez Aviles and his 800 settlers first stepped ashore to establish this city. But we do know from a Spanish city map the location of an event that happened here immediately after the landing. That was a mass of thanksgiving for a safe arrival celebrated by the fleet chaplain, Francisco Lopez de Mendoza Corrales. Following that liturgy, at which Father Lopez tells us in his diary, the surrounding indigenous people, quote, imitated all they saw done, end quote, Menendez ordered that a meal be prepared and shared with the native people. 
That religious service and communal meal constituted the first European community act of thanksgiving in what is now the United States, antedating the better known thanksgiving at Plymouth in Massachusetts by 56 years. Consider how long ago was September 8, 1565, the date of this city's founding. It was one year after the death of Michelangelo and one year after the birth of William Shakespeare. St. Augustine afterwards became the scene of many firsts. More than a settlement, it was our country's first municipality. The King of Spain, Philip II, awarded St. Augustine its own coat of arms and the right to govern itself through a cabildo, what we would call today a city commission. Here on these ancient streets were found our country's first school, first library, first hospital, first church, first mission to the natives, first sanctioned free black community, first court of law, first public market, and first city plan. One other first requires recognition. St. Augustine was our country's first social melting pot. It happened this way. Unable to grow the staples of a Spaniard's customary diet, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, in the sandy, infertile soil of this coastal plain, the majority of settlers, military and civilian alike, adopted the diet of the local Temucua natives, which was deer, gopher tortoise, shark, drum, mullet, catfish, and the cultigens maize or corn, beans, and squash, along with nuts, fruits, and miscellaneous greens. Native women worked in Spanish homes and barracks, teaching food preparation techniques. That acculturation process eventually led to intermarriage. <coughs> Spanish men took native brides. The result, relatively early in St. Augustine's history, was a mestizo culture, that is, men and women of mixed races, or our country's first melting pot. <coughs> Before concluding these all two comments about St. Augustine, I should want us all to know that this colonial city, though always small in population, was not insular. Indeed, its reach extended hundreds of miles to the north and west. In 1587, Governor Pedro Menendez Marquez, a nephew of the city's founder, welcomed the first Franciscan missionaries from Spain. Here, on a riverfront site that you can visit today, the friars built a convento, that is, a headquarters for their order. Over the following 119 years, friars from St. Augustine set out on foot to serve the spiritual and material needs of native people as far north as St. Catherine's Island, just south of Carolina, and west as far as present-day Tallahassee, where they were to enjoy their greatest successes. By 1655, those emissaries from St. Augustine had brought Christianity and Western culture to 26,000 natives. They lived among their hosts as Peace Corps volunteers live respectfully within foreign societies today. In the native pueblos, they taught not only the catechism of Christianity, but also European farming techniques, cattle and hog racing, weaving, music, and in many instances, reading and writing. To that labor, those St. Augustine friars devoted the noon and evening of their lives. As I reflect on the 450th year of this city, I am proud to report that St. Augustine made those gifts 
to the American coastline and interior. And that a gentle band of St. Augustinians, through their ministrations in the hinterlands, ensured that Florida's written history began with acts of education, social justice, and benevolent service. And so I say, Viva Florida, and Viva San Agustin, and thank you very much.